Hey, this is Joel Duff. I'm back. And today I want to talk about the peer review process. Publishing in scientific journals through the peer reviewed process. What made me think I should talk about this again is uh, I saw a recent retracted paper and uh, it's, it's a really fun example of a retraction um, but i think it's begin it allows us to start talking again about this peer-reviewed process the good the bad and the ugly All right and peer review has been under attack a lot over the last couple of years a lot of criticisms of it and i'm not going to say that those criticisms aren't uh, valid uh, i'm going to talk about some of the problems uh, with the peer review process but and i'll talk about some of the possible alternatives but really, you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, criticizing the peer review process is a little bit like poking holes in uh, democratic governments, right, or democracies. Um, you can poke, a, you can find a lot of problems, right? Everywhere you look, you can see problems. Uh, and, 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 but then when you ask yourself, okay, well, what would be my alternative? If I want to scrap this process and just replace it wholesale with something else, if I want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, what else? Am, what else am I going to do? And when you start looking at the alternatives, you quickly find out there's a lot more problems with the alternatives than maybe the the original system you were working with. So maybe it's worth asking yourself how you might be able to fix some of the problems, or at least put some patches on some of the problems and continue to use it. Ah, uh, yes, the image uh, to my side here. What's that all about? That's a little snippet. All right, from one figure from this paper that's been retracted that we're going to we're going to take a look at. Uh, and you can see uh, on this that it's it's part of a bar chart. And the top of the bar chart has these uh, error bars, except they're not really error bars. And this is what somebody noticed upon reading the paper is, you know, upon looking more closely, they realized these aren't error bars. These are capital T's placed on top of the bars to appear to be um, uh, confidence intervals. And, and so uh, this was just the first thing that they found was wrong with this particular paper that ended up in its retraction. And we'll, we'll look at uh, the, the history of the retraction uh, of this paper. Um, but it's this particular paper that, that again, got me thinking about uh, retractions, the quality of the peer review process, uh, the total number of problems, uh, problem papers that are out there. Uh, a lot of people wonder, like, well, just how many bad papers are out there that deserve to be retracted? Uh, how much can I trust the, the scientific literature? So let's talk about this paper. Then uh, I'll present another example, and then we'll talk about generally the peer review process, the problems, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, and possible fixes to it. We've got all that coming up. So here we are back uh, to the uh, a little bit larger image. So this is the full portion of that image uh, showing the T's <laughs> instead of the error bars on this figure. Uh, and where I saw this was on Twitter. I, I follow Retraction Watch and Retraction Watch is a group of individuals that have a blog that was started about 10 years ago in which they they account, uh, keep track of the different retractions in different different journals. So they're scouring journals looking for things that have been retracted. And they're also soliciting right people to uh, observe problems with papers and, and help that retraction uh, process occur. And so Retraction Watch, uh, you know, throws out all these different papers that have been retracted or in the state of retraction or they think need to be retracted. Uh, and this one was particularly has this one got a lot of conversation, right? Because, you know, this figure is kind of silly. It's got these error bars. One thing is all the error bars are the same. If you really if you didn't realize they were T's, uh, you should immediately be like a little suspicious of the data anyway, because if they all have exactly the same amount of error and they're looking at a uh, different in this case, there was measuring well, lysozyme as a, as a particular enzyme, right? You wouldn't expect to get the same errors uh, for all the different types of measurements you're doing. So that alone is a little suspicious. And then you look a little closer and there's like, well, there's T's, right? Instead of error bars, typically an error bar is going to also, error bars typically going to be 
right, look more like an eye, and it goes above and below the line. And it's showing you the, the sort of the standard deviation of, of, you know, within these ranges is, is the expected values, the, the, the real values. Um, all right, so that, so let's go look at that paper. Let's go look at it a little more closely. All right, this paper was published in Advances in Material Science and Engineering. And here, if you go now today to that particular site where that for that particular journal and you go to look up that particular article, you'll see this article has been retracted. To view the article details, please click, click on the retraction tab above, which is what we're going to do. I also want to note what journal this is in. Uh, this is in a journal that's published by a very large conglomerate called Hindawi. Hindawi publishes more than 250 journals. Um, it's an all open access. Uh, they're all open access. That's their pitch is that like you, if you go to Hindawi, you can search their 250 plus journals and every single one of those articles is open to the world for anybody to see. Right. And that's, um, that's great. Right. It means you don't have to pay to see this research. It also means that somebody has to pay for these particular articles to be published and to be edited. And that means typically the uh, person submitting the article is paying to have their article published at the site. And so we'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons, you know, of open access versus um, publishing through societies and so forth, where there's sort of a dues process and and um, the the publication costs are, are set up in a different way. Um, okay, so Hindawi, remember that for a moment. Let's take a look at the, the article itself, though. So if you were to open up now, if you were to go and download the PDF of the paper, it has this huge retracted all over every page. So it's very obvious that, OK, you can still see this paper. You can still see what had been published. Uh, they're not hiding the fact that they published this paper in this particular journal. Uh, but they're going to make it clear that this article has been retracted and that's a warning to anyone else who's researching something similar and may want to refer to this paper as like, oh, you know, so-and-so also found these particular effects or uh, and so forth. And they want to use it as a reference. It's like, probably don't you want to use this as a reference, right? This has been retracted where, you know, the data in this paper is suspect. Um, so the paper was monitoring of sports health indicators based on wearable nano nano biosensors. It has two authors. One is from a university in China. The other one from a university in the Republic of Korea. And you see one, one thing. Let me point this out real quick. It was received on the 12th of May, 2022, uh, revised on the 14th of June, 2022. Uh, and accepted on the 24th of June in 2022, and then published uh, just another week later. Uh, so it became visible um, for everybody uh, to be able to see. This is very, very fast. All right. And so one of the pros and cons of, of peer review and so forth is that uh, sometimes proper peer review takes a long time. So it takes a, time, takes a long time from the time you've collected the data, written your papers, to you actually see it in published form. And so there's always a temptation to maybe go to a journal that has a faster turnaround time. And that's something that this particular um, conglomerate really, you know, advertises is that, um, you know, the time to publication is, is fairly short. All right. So um, here is the uh, response, all right, the letter of issue. All right. So um Somebody had written a, a, a set of problems that they found with this article. So you could consider this, in a way, we could call this a post-peer review process, right? Presumably the paper was peer reviewed, but now it's out in the world and people are looking at it, right? And, and other eyes are upon it and other people start seeing issues with the paper. Uh, and take the initiative to actually write back to the journal and say, look, there's these issues. I think you need to consider this. So here's, here's the short article that the, the journal actually uh, put out there to explain the, 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 why they have retracted this paper. Um, Advances in Material Science and engineering, engineering has retracted the article titled Monitoring of Sports, Indica uh, Sports Health Indicators Based on Wearable Nanosensors. Since publication, readers have 
uh, raise concerns that the error bars in figure 9 appear to be the letter T. <laughs> Moreover, it's been noted that the authors state that no data sets were generated or analyzed during the current study, which is contrary to the study described. And I looked at the paper and, and exactly in one part of the paper, they don't they talk about how there's no data sets that were actually generated by them and analyzed. And yet they have these figures in which they've analyzed data. Um, this therefore raises questions about the reliability of the underlying data and the article's conclusions. The article includes several instances where different sections are clearly unrelated. For instance, at the survey collecting information on the fitness activity of elderly people in Jilin province, province is not well described. It is unclear how it relates to the research on nanomaterials and wearable biosensors. Furthermore, several references cited do not support the article and have been found to be irrelevant. Of note, in addition to not being relevant to the corresponding text, reference 16 was retracted prior to submission of the current article due to containing nonsensical content. In other words, this article, which has been retracted, references another article that itself was retracted before they even submitted their paper. So either they weren't aware that they were citing a retracted article, which honestly, lots of people cite retracted stuff all the time because they're unaware of it. We'll get to that problem later. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> It shows a, a lack of, um, uh, how, how shall we say it, um, being really careful, you know, in, in, uh, um, in writing their paper. It appears that the paper is a hodgepodge of stuff. Now, that can kind of happen when you have two authors and they're both, maybe I write this section, you write this section, they don't really quite congeal well together. Um, but it also could happen if they truly, really aren't, uh, you know, if this is fraudulent, all right? And then they're not going to say here that this is fraudulent. They're just pointing out problems and saying it's retracted. Um, and so you don't have to prove fraudulence in order to retract a paper. The paper simply could have, it could have accidental errors in it, but things that lead people astray because it's correct, incorrect information. And maybe the authors didn't realize that their analysis was bad or that they forgot to put something in or uh, you know, that can happen. Uh, but there is a certain percentage of actual fraudulent data out there. People are human beings and there's uh, pressure to publish um, and maybe they think they can get away with it. Honestly, this reminds me that the actual description here and actually having read a portion of the paper, it kind of reminds me of what um, uh, ChatGPT, the uh, artificial uh, writing agent, uh, might actually write, you know, if you asked it here, here, give me a whole bunch of parameters. I want you to write some text about this. Um, it almost appears that they could have used like an artificial, you know, intelligent agent uh, and thought the writing sounded good to them. But in fact, uh, it sounds nonsensical if you actually know um, what's going on here. Finally, we would also like to acknowledge that a reader raised concerns that an incorrect notation was used in equation 13 and 14. However, they, it does appear the error was made during the reproduction of uh, the production process. So something about the conversion of their text into the formatted and being formatted for publication. Uh, and so the publisher itself apologizes for this error. All right, so they incorporated their own error into this particular paper. Now, here's I think is the, the, the most interesting part and probably the portion that, that gives you an idea of, of maybe the uh, the intent in the authors. The authors did not respond to our summary of the concerns nor our request to provide the original data and ethics approval documentation. All right, they're doing, you're using human subjects so they should have uh, documented at their institution that they have approval to study human subjects and so forth. There's a lot of, lot of hoops you have to go through for that. Uh, and so they probably have like in the paper, they have like a, you know, we have this approval X number or whatever, right? But they're not showing all the paperwork. Uh, and so they're asked like, okay, hey, send us the actual documentation from your institution saying that you have approval to do this. They don't respond to that. After careful assessment of concerns raised, we have concerns about the article's scientific reliability and are therefore retracting. All right, and you see that this happened fairly quickly, right? 
Um, they received an issue about this on the 15th of December, made, you know, made, uh, uh, were made aware of this, uh, and they uh, published this, what you're reading right now, on the 19th of December 2022. So great, you know, they, the, 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 in this case, the publisher uh, or editor of this particular journal uh, under this larger umbrella of Hindawi uh, took responsibility for having published something that wasn't probably what peer reviewed very well, right? I mean, that, that's, it's just obvious that this journal, this article was not reviewed sufficiently. Uh, these errors should have been caught well before it ever got to the publication uh, step. Uh, here is an actual screenshot from the paper, and here's where you'll see this, uh, the error, it was, I also noticed that they, they don't ever talk about the error, all right? They don't even mention in their figure legend or anywhere else what that there are error bars, all right? So it's just a, a poorly written paper as well. Now, I, you know, it may be that these two individuals, and I didn't go far enough, far enough to look to do a bunch of background research here. Uh, I'm just speculating these two individuals might be engineers. Um, and But they're actually working in a world of biosensors, and so there's sort of a biological element to this. Uh, and in terms of publishing in biological literature, uh, there are other expectations uh, in terms of how to deal with statistics. Could be they're just way outside their element, right? Uh, and it may be that, uh, that the, I mean, I'm just speculating here. It could be the editor looked at their graphs and said, you need error bars on these. And um, they didn't go back or they didn't know how to go back and look at their data and actually calculate, all right, the standard deviation and put these error bars on the figures. And so they just cheated, right? I mean, because at that point, that's what you'd have to call it, right? They just fudged it. They put these T's on there that look like error bars. Um, boy, if I was going to fudge something, I would at least make a, a capital I, right? And make it actually look like an error bar. Um, but, you know, when you had a quick turnaround, I mean, as we saw, you know, within two days, they have a revision in. And if that's what they're doing, I mean, they're just quickly slapping something on there in order to get it published. Now, one of the, one of the issues I have with these particular journals, which in another talk I called predatory journals, um, is that the cost for publishing, I mean, these two authors are probably paying anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500 uh, in order to publish uh, this paper in this particular journal. Uh, and, and they're also paying really for quick turnaround. And so there's just, it's, the, the system is fraught with having these kind of errors crop up a lot. All right, so let's go back. Let's go back to Hindawi. All right, here's their main site. And if you were to go to Hindawi, I think it's just Hindawi.com. Um, you could then search all of their different journals, minimizing the impact of research through openness because science works best when research is open. And that sounds like a, like a great little subline, right? That, uh, that everyone, research should be open. Everybody in the world should be able to access all the information that's being generated by scientists uh, and easily accessible. Uh, unfortunately, easy access um, comes, uh, like I said before, there's a, there's a cost to this, right? Hindawi is, a, a, uh, is not a, um, a non-profit organization. It's a for-profit company whose, whose business is publishing. And when your business and your bottom line is uh, making money, uh, it's very tempting right, to accept as many papers as possible and accept them as quickly as possible, all right? And the more work you have to do, the more editors you have to have and pay, the more uh, reviewers you have to find, which, are, which is becoming increasingly difficult because the total number of papers has just been going up exponentially over the last 20 years. And it's becoming harder and harder and harder to find enough reviewers uh, to review things. Yes, there are more scientists, I guess you could say, but the amount of output that scientists are, are producing because of our technology and our ability to write, our ability to uh, you know, have students and generate data is increasing so fast. The, and, and many, many individuals need publications um, uh, in their tenure process and so forth, right? There's a lot of pressure on the system uh, the peer-reviewed system, which traditionally has operated in a mostly 
uh, altruistic way, right? That we believe that this is a, a good system for checks and balances in terms of uh, assuring the quality of the information that's published. But it requires a lot of people like myself at institutions like I am at, like a public institution, for when we get asked to review something by a journal, because it's in our area, you know, this, this particular topic is in our area of expertise, that, that we would do that. And we're not getting paid for it, right? It's just part of your uh, being part of the scientific community and your contribution to it. But when faculty are more crunched, as many are in many institutions, for teaching more, doing more things. There's not a lot of, um, not a lot of credit. You know, if I, if I review 25 more papers next year than I do this year, uh, I'm not going to see any tangible reward for that. I'm just going to see a lot more work. Uh, and so it's, it, it's becoming a, it, the, the system is being, um, the system is stressed, let us put it that way, because the stress that faculty are under uh, and just there aren't enough faculty doing enough reviews. And so you're going to end up with bad data slipping through because it's not looked at as carefully because they're finding reviewers that maybe aren't as qualified. Right. You're finding reviewers who maybe are not in that particular field. I get requests all the time for stuff now from these types of journals. Um, when I say these types of journals, I say like lower tier journals that are high throughput and people are paying to, to, uh, to publish there. And so I'm getting an editor who is asking me to review something in there. And it's like not even close to something I'm an expert on. They just want somebody to take a look at it. Well, I'm not going to be able to do a, a, a really good job of reviewing that article versus somebody is trying to publish something that's directly in my area of research and I know the field and I know the literature and I know the types of data analysis they're doing and I know the types of experiments that they might performing, be performing. And so I can, I can more properly address that uh, than I can some of these other papers that recently I've been asked to, to publish. And I, I just say no to those, right? I reject those. I, I'm not interested in reviewing something that, I, that I'm not really qualified to review. Um, and so the, the question here, even with this paper, is did it even get reviewed at all? Did the editor even send it to anyone? Or did the editor just look at it and go like, yeah, this looks good to me, um, and kind of fake it through the review process? And Dawi has been, uh, just this year, they did a mass retraction of more than 500 papers. Uh, and it was because they did an internal search in which they, they essentially reviewed a bunch of editors. They looked at the um, they looked at all the articles that certain review, certain editors had done. They found out that there were some inconsistencies, some bad actors, right? Some, some editors that really weren't doing their job. You know, they are getting paid, right, to distribute the, to, to reviewers, to collect their reviews, to then write their own review and make decisions. Um, but in some cases, they weren't actually sending them out for review. And then they were just telling the authors, oh, yeah, we, we, we accept your paper. You know, I've, you know it's, it, it's been accepted. The reviewers didn't have any problem with it. Well, that's just, that's just lying. Um, and so in some cases, those, some of those papers might have been okay papers. Um, but they decided to retract them anyway because they, they, didn't, they weren't effectively uh, peer-reviewed. Um, and you want to be responsible for saying you know, that these are peer-reviewed when they're not peer-reviewed. Um, so it's not saying that they're all fraud. And it's not even saying that all those papers were, were bad papers. Um, now, I think this might be happening because Hindawi uh, was recently purchased by Wiley & Sons, a U.S. Uh, company, uh, which is a large publisher. And um, they have something of a much better reputation than Hindawi had originally. Um, and so I think what they're trying to do is I think they're saying, well, we need to clean up this, you know, this process. So we've, we've bought this conglomerate. Yes, we want to make money with it, but it, we have to improve its reputation. And the best way to improve its reputation is to say, let's weed out the bad editors. Uh, let's put in some more effective processes. Let's retract some papers um, and try to get our, our, you know, the quality up uh, in these. And so I do applaud them for that. Uh, I think they're going to continue to have a lot of issues with these papers, but, but nonetheless, um, that's an improvement. Now, I've already told this story before, so I'm going to do this very quickly. And if you want to look at my uh, predatory journal um, uh, video, 
Uh, I go through in a lot of detail this one that has to do with a, uh, a creationist who's also publishing in a um, secular journal, except that the journal they're publishing in is one of these what I call predatory journals or um, you know pay-to-play journals. Um, or another word for them would be paper mills, all right? Places that just generate churn out papers and there's very little interest in the overall quality of those papers. It's just, uh, you know, getting lots of papers out so they have lots of clicks and views and so forth, right? Um, and this, this one has to do with um, uh, this author here, Chang Laura Tan, who... Um, in this case, is published in a Young Earth Creationist journal, which they claim is a peer-reviewed journal. And in my other talk, I talk a lot about what might that mean for a Young Earth Creationist organization who is trying to also say that they peer-review their material um, and sort of try to, in a way, it's them admitting that they think that the peer review process is something that's respected, and so therefore they're trying to do also do this peer reviewed thing in order for their their particular papers to be respected because they can say, hey, they've been peer reviewed. Um, in in my way of thinking, since many of their articles are so bad, right, uh, it kind of drags the peer review process down in terms of the reputation of peer review, uh, just like some of these journals do that I'm talking about. So in that particular article, which was published at a Young Earth Creationist journal, Answers Research Journal. Um, she refers to her own work uh, in, um, as a reference. Uh, and that's what caught my eye, all right? And, and the reference was to holistic study of whole genomes in the Journal of Genome. Uh, number one uh, episode from, uh, episode, number one um, uh, from that particular uh, journal, the number one article from that year. Uh, in 2017 and uh, published at uh, omicsonline.org and I didn't know what that was and so I went and looked it up and here it is it's the journal of genome this is one of the 250 journals that uh, Hindawi um, uh, the company Hindawi publishes uh, and in this case so here is her publication holistic study of whole genomes and what I found was that, uh, now look at, now here's, here's the trend here, right? Received date, December 9th, 2017. Accepted date, December 11th, 2017, two days later. Published date, December 14th, 2017, three days later. Now, this is an editorial. This isn't like a full-blown research uh, article, and an editorial doesn't necessarily have to be peer-reviewed. Uh, now, I have seen this paper referred to as being a peer-reviewed journal, a peer-reviewed paper, all right, by other creationists who then will link to this paper because they like to link to papers that are published in secular journals, right, that, um, that support things that they, they want to say. All right, and they'll say, oh, look, this peer-reviewed journal. Uh, but I don't really think this was peer-reviewed. Um, this is an editorial. A lot of times editorials are invited by a like an editor, like, hey, could you write this? But really, in this case, I think she invited herself. Uh, this is the entire article. I'm showing you the, the entire thing. All right, so it's a one and a half pages. Uh, and if you look at... Um, like 2018, I mean, 2017, I think they published, this journal published only two papers. In 2018, they published three, all right? And here's all three. So cytogenomics in the, or in the omics area full of conceptual chasms. And then holistic study of whole genomes. Oh yeah, I forgot. Um, and she listed as 2017, but actually it's published in 2018. I don't know, I don't know where the error came from there. Uh, there's only three articles in this year of 2018. Here's the thing about that. You know, I mentioned that uh, this editorial, I think that she invited herself to write it. Um, she was a, she is currently and was in 2018 an editor at this particular journal. All right. She's an editor at this journal. And the thing that I wanted to note about this is uh, this individual right here who published the other paper is an editor of this journal. She is an editor of this journal. And one of these authors, can't remember which one, is an editor of this journal. 
And so this journal, Journal of Genome, uh, is an extremely small journal with respect to like how many papers are published. Uh, there's nothing been published in 2018 and there's like one in 2022. Uh, and I went back to 2017 and two of them there are also published by editors of the journal themselves. So now this isn't a terribly profitable journal because probably by being an editor, you get a break. You might even get a free, like you get to publish one time free in this journal because you're an editor. So there's some incentive to say like, oh, I'll become an editor when I'm asked. And, and I get these re requests all the time from Indawe publications. I must have at least 50 requests in my email box uh, inviting me to become an editor of one of these journals. I you know that's going to look great on my CV. I'm an editor of the Journal of Genome. Uh, and a lot of times these are not paid positions, though. It's sort of like, hey, you know, you get to put this on your CV. You get to say you're doing work for the scientific community. And if you work for a small college, um, you need to do that kind of service. And that's something that you're going to, I mean, if you work for a big university, you need to do that as well. But um, if you're a small school and you're not doing a, a lot of research, you might want to show more activity uh, in the scientific community. And one way to do it would be to help edit journals, uh, whether you're paid or not. And so they entice people to become editors this way of some journal that sounds like it's all great. And so here you have like four or five people listed as editors. And then as an editor, you can then uh, publish something more easily in that particular journal. Um, because you're an editor there. Now, she might have had one of the other editors look at it. I don't know. I mean, maybe nobody looked at it, uh, but I'll, I'll try to put it in the most positive light. Maybe she asked somebody else, one of the other editors, to look at her article. But I think she wrote something, sent it to one of the other editors, and they're like, oh, yeah, this looks fine. Let's, let's publish it in there. And they might have, she might have had to pay for it. Uh, I haven't looked up the rules uh, for editors of this particular journal. Um, but sometimes they might get like certain number of pages for free. In which case, in Dawe, which is a for-profit company, if this journal only ever publishes, <laughs> if they only ever publish articles by actual editors themselves, and they're giving those pages for free, this journal isn't making any money. Um, but what, of course, they hope to do is if they can get enough people to publish in this paper, in this journal, then this journal and this journal gets a certain number of clicks because there's a certain number of articles there. Uh, and then it gets a little bit more notice and other people might think it's legitimate. And if other be people begin to think it's legitimate, then other people might start submitting papers here, right? And they're also hoping that if they can get 10 editors to agree to be editors as a line on their CV, that also they'll be like, oh, I've got this friend and I, they would like to publish something that sounds like it might be appropriate for this journal. I'll tell them, hey, I can, I can help you get published here. Uh, but you notice that that creates also conflicts of interest, right? You know, in biases, right? Because that, that means you have, you have vested interest in like, okay, I can, oh, I can help you get published in this particular journal, right? Because I'm an editor here. I can find the right reviewers. And honestly, I think the other reviewers are probably just the other editors, right? And then they have an interest in maybe building up and having more articles published because if they get more articles published in the same journal and they're also publishing in that journal, well, then the reputation of the journal is better. There's a whole ranking of different journals and so forth. And so you want to improve your ranking. Um, as there's a lot of ways to manipulate those rankings by these sort of lower tier journals. All right. Now, all this sounds, you know, kind of like, hey, I can see where there might be a lot of problems with this. And there are. But honestly, what happens, the reason why there's only three publications in this in this particular year and not been any for a couple of years is because uh, most scientists can see through this stuff and they say, like, it's not really a legit journal, all right? And if I publish in that journal, even if I did a really good job and I wrote a really good paper, for one thing, it's not going to get noticed. And anyone who sees my paper and they see what journal it is, they're going to be suspicious. The, uh, they're going to, they're not going to, have a good feeling about my data and my my research, even if it's even if it's good, right? They're they're probably not going to um, uh, give it much thought. And so as 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 I think about where I want to publish something, I want to put it into a journal that's going to be seen 
by people who have the most interest in the topic that I'm that I'm interested in, in talking about. And so I want to get to the right people. And I also want to get it into the journal that has the best possible reputation that also gets it to the right people because then it will get the most reads and it will get the most citations. And although I'm not into like, you know, hey, I got to get as many citations as possible, uh, it doesn't it doesn't really impact me in terms of my uh, my job and raises and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's best for the scientific community. You want to get it into circulation. Um, and so we have hundreds of these journals for which, you know, whether these things have even been, you know, read three or four times. I mean, they're, they're, they're barely seen at all. But they're great places if you want to, like, publish something that uh, you just want to say you have a publication. Right. I just need a publication and I want to say I'm published and I can say, like, I, you know, I already told you I've published more than 50 articles in peer reviewed journals. But what if I told you that 48 of them were in journals like this? I mean, because honestly, I could do it right. In fact, in the next two days, I don't know what I would write about, but I'm sure I could come up with an idea and I could write about something and I could, you know, get some pieces of data together that I have sitting around. And I could write up an article and I could get it published in a couple of weeks in one of these journals. But I had to fork out $1,500 to $2,000 uh, to do it. But I'm pretty sure I could get something accepted there. And I could say like, yeah, there's publication number 54. But um, what would that do for me? It really wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't get seen. All right. And it, it's not really a contribution. Um and it would actually diminish the impression people have of my research um, if I publish there. So that's that's part of, you know, when you hear about horrible stories in publishing, a lot of those horrible stories come from places like this. And it's not like scientists aren't, un aren't aware of these journals. Now, sometimes people get fooled. Um, you're just looking at someone's CV, they, you know, they're applying for a job um, or they're, they're applying for a grant and you just look, oh, they got all these different publications and you're not, you're not really in that field. And so you, you might not know like, oh, these journals really aren't very good journals, right? It's like they couldn't get their stuff into one of the top, you know, tier journals or even middle tier journals. They went all for these low tier journals where they're just forking out money paying for uh, to get these things published in order for them to now hopefully get a, you know, 200,000 or $500,000 grant. Um, you know, you have enough people who are, are wary, all right. And, and realize that um, you probably don't want to put that much money in someone's hands if they're not going to be willing to do the kind of work that's necessary to get published in a better journal. And what makes a journal a better journal, better peer review. I, it's, it, better peer reviewed, reviewed by actual experts in the field, resulting in papers that are more impactful over the long run. Okay, so just to really, let's just go through uh, a quick review of some criticisms of traditional peer review system. All right, there's a possibility of bias. The peer review system can be, hey, it can be susceptible to bias. There's gender bias. There's multiple papers written on uh, actually analyzing uh, the time to publication for, I mean, because you can do this for hundred thousands and thousands of papers. How long did it take someone to publish in, in particular journals? Uh, when did they submit it? When did it get accepted? And you can look at female versus male and you find out like uh, if the authors are female or first, first author is female, it takes longer to get published. There may be a bias there. Maybe the reviewers have a bias. Uh, they're more critical. Um, there's it could be a racial bias. There's a bias toward more established researchers, for sure. People get uh, well-respected because they are established. They've published a lot of other stuff before. And sometimes things can slip through the cracks simply because you're like, oh, I, I know that person or I've read a ton of their papers. They're really good. You don't really, you know, your antenna isn't up as high and you're kind of just like, oh, yeah, this sounds good. I'm sure it's all fine. I'm really busy. I got other things to do. I'll just say that this paper is good. All right. Then it means that it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like LeBron James. And, um, you know, you're not going to quite get as many fouls, um, you know, called on you as like the newest guy on the court. All right, you, you, there's a benefit of the doubt type of thing going on there. 
All right, so there is a there is that kind of bias that's going, and you have to be aware of that all the time uh, in the system. So that leads to inequities in the publication process. It can be easier to publish if you've already published a lot. And if you've published in a lot of really good journals, well, then those lower tier journals, if you're publishing there, they're going to be like, wow, great. We can get this person, you know, this person's publishing with us. Awesome, right? It's going to slip through a whole lot easier. And so that's an issue. There's a time lag issue. Um, and... Uh, this one's a hard one to fix. The peer review process can be it can be really time consuming. Um, now, in the olden days, 20 or 30 years ago, if you didn't have like hot, hot news, like this is groundbreaking stuff that everybody needs to know about right away. It's time sensitive. Um, and it's just like this is the project I've been working on for a couple of years. And I finally got my data together. You're going to submit it to the some journal that's part of some society. It's going to go to an editor. And especially before all the internet and all that, right? You had to ship it off in like 10 cop, 10, literally you had to like print off 10 copies of this thing, uh, you know, and you just send off a box because you'd have like this really thick paper because you're doing it in, um, uh, um, you're doing it in, what was it called? Double spacing and so forth, right? And you have all your figures separate and all that. And then the editor gets it uh, he's going to look through it and then he's going to ship it right to different reviewers. And then they have, you know, a month or two to look at it and then you get the reviews back and then you've got a month or two to, to like make your corrections. It's going to end up being a year. And there are many times where stuff gets stretched out for two or three years. But from the time you first submitted your journal, your, your article to you actually seeing it published, sometimes it might be a year and a half and then, OK, it's been accepted. But we're publishing only, you know, 25 papers per issue. And, you, you know, we've accepted your paper, but it's like six issues out before it'll actually come out and in, in publish in, in print. Now, with the Internet and with uh, publishing online, a lot of that's changed, right? A lot of that's sped up. But the biggest part of it and the most important part of that process is the peer reviewed process, which is a person actually reading your paper and having the time to spend writing about it and getting uh, responses back. Um, all right. So the, the slow dissemination of research findings, you know, that does hinder the progress of the field. There's a, there's a real temptation to try to push that faster and faster and faster. Well, that puts pressure on the peer reviewed system. And that creates more errors, right? You can expect more errors in the system as a result. All right. And that goes to the whole issue of quality review, right? If you're pushing things to go be as fast as possible, then your quality is probably going to go down. Some reviewers providing really thorough and constructive feedback. I have had people who have written three, four, five pages of notes on my papers. Um, I've had extremely thorough reviews and I've had others that just write three or four lines. You know, it's like, oh, yep, this sounds good. You should publish that. Um, and and what's what becomes interesting is when you get like one of those and then your other reviewer, the second reviewer, uh, who says, you know, who writes four pages on something and the other person write, you know, half a paragraph. Uh, and one thinks it's great and the other one's just like completely trashing the paper. Uh, it's likely that the second person who's trashing the paper actually has read the paper and, and really knows something more about it. And the other one's just like, okay, this is one of many I have to do and uh, I'm just moving on. All right, so there's inconsistency in the peer review process. Uh, and that's, of course, is going to potentially result in lower quality research if especially you get a series of reviewers who aren't spending the right amount of time uh, with it. My biggest problem is sometimes if you're writing on something that's more controversial uh, and, and really the papers I've written that have to do with young earth creationism or creationism in general um, and I'm being reviewed by uh, secular authors um, who may or may not really understand some of the ins and outs. They have very different, those reviewers might have very different ideas about like the angle you should take or how important something you're doing is or whether it's even appropriate for a journal. And so they might have very conflicting um, views on the quality and the appropriateness of, you know, the paper. Uh, and so one of my one of my recent papers uh, went back and forth with uh, three different um, reviewers and to the reviewers. I went back and forth with three different times. Um, 
And the thing is you couldn't please all the reviewers because you know if you're making the changes for one, it actually made one of the other reviewers upset. So that's those can be really challenging issues. And that's where you're relying on your editor to say, I'm looking at the big picture here. And for the journal, I think that you know it's appropriate to go in this direction. And then they can guide the author to say, like, I'm I'm not gonna I understand their concerns, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in this direction um, with you. Uh, and then there is some issues at times with lack of transparency. All right. And there are good things about it all being anonymous. So many journals are anonymous. You don't know who wrote the reviews unless they want to self-disclose. Uh, you know, not not knowing uh, can be good because you 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 might not want to reveal who you are because maybe you actually have worked with that person, although we try to avoid having people that have worked with other people closely. But you certainly know about people and you don't you don't want to like it would be hard to say something really bad about someone's work if that person wanted to work with them in the future. Um, and so it's better to be anonymous. Um, but it can also be difficult for authors to really understand uh, the criticisms and have and there can also be issues with if it's anonymous people who don't like other people because people have personalities right people who don't like other people can even find it more easy to be critical or to try to stop someone from publishing something um, or maybe they have some similar ideas, right? And they want to publish and they want to slow down that other publication, right? So there's a lot of other factors that come into play there. Uh, and so that's one of the things that's often discussed is transparency. And there is many journals, including top tier journals now, that actually will publish the reviews themselves. Um, personally, I like that. Uh, even if they're anonymous, um, seeing what, what the reviews were, like with the paper itself, and then seeing the, the author's responses to it. So you can see the back and forth. And so you can see how the, the changes have been made are really great sometimes. So there's conflict of interest. And I kind of was already talking about that, right? That uh, if a reviewer has a personal or professional relationship with the author, and this, this, is, this is the problem with the lower tier journals mostly. Uh, I don't want to say mostly. It happens all over the place. But the lower tier journals, is just a, a lot of pressure to publish. Um, in these uh, for you know for profit uh, type situations, uh, and that has a, a strong effect on the outcomes of reviews. And peer review only it doesn't work for everything. Uh, and there's a lot of things that that aren't peer reviewed. Uh, and even in journals that have, like I just said, editorials, and there are other things that don't get peer reviewed in the same way. And yet we talk about them as being peer reviewed. So there's there's a lot of sort of squishiness in the in the peer reviewed. Uh, system and then of course there's the issue of cost cost has gone way up um i don't you know when i said that uh, open access you know there's like it's basically pay to pay to print or pay to publish i didn't mean that you don't have to pay to publish in other journals either i mean if i published in nature or science and some of these other top journals uh, there is a publication cost to that now, for some societies, you know, like the Botanical Society of America, if you, you're joining that society and you, that's a professional society and they publish a journal that's related to that society. Now, if I'm a member of that society, I get X number of pages uh, per year that I could that I could publish. Uh, and that cuts down on the cost of publication, except that I've already paid for the, the you know, the membership to the society. I mean, I can go to the annual meeting and so forth. And so that that's a way for people to get together and to and to coordinate in ways um, way beyond just the publication process. The publication thing is just a is an arm of that society. And so the society itself is is um, getting the the is is getting edit editors and the quality of their journal is dependent on their editors. And so there there's a vested interest in that society, which is a, typically a nonprofit organization to do the best job that they possibly can. Um, but at the end of the day, most of these journals and most of even societal journals now have publication costs. And so having a grant or having the university or college help pay for the cost of publication can be important. But one of the ways to offset the cost of publication by societies and other groups is to, um, when they sell their print copies, uh, well, they sell their print copies or when they put them into um, uh, libraries and so forth, 
there is a charge for libraries to have access to those journals, right? To either have the physical copies, and well, not so much the physical copies anymore. They're almost gone by the wayside. But now what you have is like the library has access to this publisher or this particular society's journals. Uh, and that allows them to give access to their students so they can be able to see those papers. So they're open to those who have access to that particular library, but the library has bought the rights to that. And that helps offset the cost for me to publish in that particular journal. All right, But it does mean that because of the expense of it all, um, they can't just make it open access because if they made it completely open access, then libraries would have no reason to have to pay for that. And in which case they wouldn't have any money, in which case, how are they going to pay the editors and how do they, how are they going to do the process of actually, you know, publishing these articles? Um, the money's got to come from somewhere. So I can either pay a small amount and but that means it goes into a journal that may not be accessible to everybody, or I can pay a large amount, which is essentially me buying access for the world to see what I've written. Um, there's good and bad to both of those. And you can argue all day long about which is the better system. And a lot of journals now have kind of a mixture, right? If you go to nature, science, PNAS, um, they'll have a mixture of some open access articles in which they, they're open to everybody. Sometimes they put like their really hot, interesting articles, uh, will be open access. But in order to get access to all the articles and to the backlog of like the history of articles, you're going to have to pay for that kind of uh, access um, to it. And as many of you who aren't part of an academic situation uh, and try to get access to scientific publications, you're probably really frustrated because you'll find it's like we want you to pay $49.99 or $100 or $29.99 for access to this one simple paper. Uh, what are some alternatives then to this peer reviewed process? Well, there's a, um, and, and we've seen this a lot in the last couple of years, especially the, um, the bio RX, uh, IV, uh, these are preprint servers. So a preprint server is this platform where researchers, so I could write a manuscript and I could send the manuscript to one of these preprint servers. So it's before printing, right? It's like before publication. And when I put it there, it gets an accession number and uh, it gets cataloged. I mean, Google can find it, um, especially Google Scholar uh, can find and access that. And somebody can even reference an article if they want. Now, there are people who will never reference peer reviewed. I'm mean, sorry, will never reference a preprint server article because they don't consider them published uh, because they're not peer reviewed. And then others who are more willing to do that, right? And so there's some personal preference there. Um, but you you put up this article on the preprint server, and it's open to the world. And then typically there is a there's a way to comment on those articles. And what should happen is the authors should be able to see like here's all these comments, right? Like if these other authors from the first paper we talked about had put something up on the preprint server and they had no error bars, somebody probably would have pointed that out to them. And if they'd put capital T's on the top of their bar charts, I'm guessing that if 10 people looked at that paper, one of them would have noticed it and they should have said something about it. In which case, um, the authors would be clued in that, um, okay, yes, their paper is out there, but it's not really published uh, in a journal. And before they can put it in a journal, they're going to need to make some fixes on that. So the preprint thing is kind of a way to vet, uh, let the world vet your articles. Now, there's a lot of abuses to us, though. And we saw this with the, uh, uh, especially with uh, coronavirus, all right, because there's thousands and thousands of, anybody anywhere could write up their thoughts on uh, coronavirus and do some study or they could watch 10 patients in a hospital and here's what I observed. Uh, I gave them all this and this is what happened. They write it, they put it up on the, on the BioRxV and what happens there is that because the public can see it, you get politicians and you get the press and you get other people who are like, oh, look, so such and such study shows X, right? It hasn't been peer reviewed. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of junk 
that gets put on the on this and 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 it can be used for ill all right so there can be people with agendas right a person could say like i have an agenda right i believe x that nobody else is writing about and so you put up your own paper with your own data that supports that you interpret the data in the way you want to uh, and then a whole bunch of other people who also want to believe what you've just written they're going to start referencing that right and you say oh look there's a this person wrote this, right? And it's published, right? Well, I guess it is published in a way. And so I'll see on Facebook or Twitter, like pointing me to, you know, like, you got to go see this article. It's like, this is the proof, All right? So the general public doesn't understand the qual. They can't distinguish between the quality of different articles. I could look at 25 different articles there on a particular topic. And I was like, this one's complete and utter gibberish. I could easily pick out the problems. Um, with it kind of like this article we started out with it's just you know it's full of errors um, versus something that's really high quality work and there is high quality work that's published on preprint servers and so it requires some discrimination and unfortunately in today's society discrimination isn't something that uh, we find a whole lot of uh, out there um, then there's open peer-reviewed this is really kind of a similar process in the sense that if you put it on a preprint server, you are opening yourself to open peer review. But open peer review would be, that's where technically open peer review is, um, you're actually asking for peers to review. Um, so an editor can ask a bunch of peers to review and then they have to put their name on it, right? So they the, the, the person who gets the feedback knows who the reviewer is. And that cuts out on some of the uh, problems with being anonymous creates other problems, uh, but it gets around the anonymous issues, all right? So it allows for more open and honest feedback, all right? And it can help reduce bias because you can see what people, you know, who somebody is, where they're coming from, what their background is and so forth, and understand more about why they might say that, understand like, oh, they actually know what they're talking about because I know that they, uh, they studied this particular thing and I need to take that particular comment seriously. All right, so... And there is a fair amount of this actually occurring uh, in the peer review process now is that, is that there's more openness in the sense that we're identifying individuals. Uh, and then there are some journals, I've been involved in some journals where it's like they actually ask you, um, you know, when you accept to review something, they'll say, are you willing to um, have your name associated with your review? And you could choose to remain anonymous or you could choose to be open uh, about it. And so that's that's sort of a compromise view. Um, then there's post-publication peer review. All right, so this is where, and, and I kind of think of preprint services this way. It's like you publish first. You, you're like, I put it out there in the world. Then it gets reviewed by a bunch of people who can give feedback. And then um, that feedback might result in, well, if it's really bad feedback, you might get results in a retraction. If it's feedback that requires changes, people can make changes or a ratum, or they could actually edit the journal, the article themselves and then republish it. Uh, so update the articles. So there's like a constant updating of some of these articles. And some preprint servers do that. There's like version one and then there's another version and then there's another version. So it's a good, an iterative process of change over time. You know, but, but then you're also subject to reviewers who you don't really know who's reviewing it, right? It could be somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about uh, versus experts. And it also requires experts to be diligent about looking at all these papers rather than being asked directly, potentially, you know, by, uh, by an editor to look at it. So the editorial process is, you know, in, in the best of all worlds, the editor knows a lot of people and is able to figure out who might be best at reviewing a particular paper. The editor can't possibly know everything they need to know to review all these papers, but they should be able to figure out who should review papers to get the best possible uh, feedback uh, for them. And then, of course, there's just plain old self-publishing, right? I mean, if you're going to if you're going to eschew the peer review process, you're going to say like, well, there's all these biases. You can't trust peer review because they're just their friends or helping other people get stuff published. Or one of the biggest criticisms would be my view is not the standard view. And therefore, uh, reviewers aren't going to like my view because they're just part of this paradigm of belief. And I'm trying to buck that system. 
and so they're not going to allow me to get reviewed, to get uh, peer reviewed. By the way, a lot of this type of stuff ends up in low tier journals where there's less peer review, right? And more emphasis on just just getting a paper out. Um, those articles in that journal genome are all let's call them uh, alternative science, right? They're all supporting some kind of very alternative hypotheses that are uh, way outside the mainstream. And it's true, those papers would have difficulty getting published in a more mainstream journal. And you might say it's because, well, because all the individuals are have the mainstream beliefs and they're gonna be skeptical. But uh, the point of, coming up with good data and good arguments is that if you had proper peer review and you had no bias in the system and people were just looking at the data and saying this is a good paper, there are journals that will publish stuff that goes against and is contrary to popular opinion, right? Or popular views or the most uh, typical view or the, the view of the day, all right? And some journals, like that's their they view that as their responsibility that's the way we move science forward right this person put it forward a cogent argument and they have interpreted their data in a way that seems appropriate i might disagree with it but we're going to publish it because they have gone through the steps of doing the scientific process in a proper way um, but nonetheless there's going to be skeptics here to say like it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how good my paper is or how qual what the quality of my res my results and my data are they're, it's just going to get rejected, right? These anonymous reviewers are just going to throw my paper out and I'll never get it published. And so it's best for me to just do self-publishing. And if I just publish it myself, then others who want to see my work will be able to see it. Great, but it also isn't reviewed, right? It's it's kind of like, um, you know, you you are doing your own thing. It's, it's like self publishing almost anything there's there's going to be some good self-published stuff and there are people who like don't like the restrictions of like paid restrictions and they want to have, have a lot more things to say or they have a particular angle that they just feel like has to be in their particular paper that maybe editors thought should be removed well you can always go the self-publishing route um, but there's a lot of scientists who will refuse to reference self-published work because they're going to feel like i can't rely on that having been edited right I, I don't know or reviewed so i don't know how trustworthy that person's data is uh, and if it's not gone through some process uh, i don't want to then reference it because by referencing it i am then drawing attention to it and saying that i believe that particular data right that i'm that i'm supporting that particular uh, piece of information all right so uh, you know, the, 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 the peer review process is, uh, it's got its flaws. It's not perfect, but there is no perfect system. Um, and, it, and there are going to be different ways of doing it in different fields because each different field of science has their own, um, you know, quirks. And then, of course, there's peer reviewed in English lit and all kinds of other areas too, and they have their own challenges as well. Um, but as I said at the beginning, um, the peer review process is, it's hard to, it's hard to come up with a de novo, come up with a new way to find, to validate or find legit legitimacy in results in scientific literature, uh, apart from some kind of review process. Um, and you know, what happens with the, uh, I guess what I'll mention is the retraction stuff. There is a growing emphasis on their data, and a lot of people, the public, will hear about retracted articles, right? They hear about these famous retracted articles, like, uh, like the, uh, uh, the real famous one of of the work, which presumably had shown that uh, autism was connected to vaccines, uh, and that one's still cited thousands of times by people who believe that, right? Even though the article has been retracted. Um, and there are hundreds of other retracted articles that have been retracted for years, and yet people still reference them. And that's the complexity of science, too, is that, um, you know, once somebody references something and other people have it, or I've, I've downloaded the paper, I have it on my computer, I'm not going to go back to the journal and find out, like, check 10 years later and see, oh, was this retracted before I published something? Once again, so you can end up sharing misinformation very easily. I mean, you see how misinformation can get spread around, and once you have 
bad articles and bad data, right, in journals. It's going to continue to get, especially if it becomes part of meta meta papers or meta uh, analyses. Meta analyses is where like I take the data from hundreds of other papers, combine it all together and do my own analysis. But what if 10 of those papers were retracted because, you know, some of them were fraudulent, like people made up data. Well, then you're including made up data in your work. This puts even more stress on the scientific system because um, what, a, what a reviewer should do is they should be able to look at the, they should go down and actually look at all the references. And they should, you know, somebody, hopefully, if you have several reviewers, one of those reviewers will go like, you know what, that article that they're referencing is a retracted paper, and they include it in their data analysis, all right? And so uh, you need to pull that out and redo your analysis. That would be the suggestion for by the reviewer. Um, that takes people who know about the retractions. And the good thing is there is this blog and other things like I follow retraction watch. So you see like these papers have been retracted and hopefully you remember some of those. Um, so the whole system really needs to have experts who have a large base of knowledge and who are reviewing other people's work. So if you go back to like, Hey, I, I just publish my own stuff. I self publish. Well, if you self publish and you are doing some big study and you can't get it published anywhere and you just, push all this out. You write a book. All right. That's the thing a lot of people do is they just write a book, right? And publish it themselves. But then in it, you include all kinds of references to that are retracted papers. They're full of bad data, but you didn't have a reviewer. You didn't have any expert look at your work to be able to point out to you that you're using that stuff. Now, honestly, a lot of times this is all part of the fraud. This is part of the miscommunication that's intentional, right? People have agendas. So again, Self-publishing is almost, you know, it's more fraught with agendas than peer review because self-publishing is often done because there is an agenda there, right? I'm pushing a particular perspective and what am I going to do? I'm going to find all the possible data points I can that's going to, that's going to favor my particular view. And uh, are you going to very carefully look through all that and make sure that it's not fraudulent data itself? No, you're likely to like use all that information and you needed a reviewer, right? You needed somebody outside. You needed somebody who was independent of you to look at it and say, I know you really, really want to believe this, but you really can't use that data, right? You, you shouldn't use that data because that data is inappropriate data to use in your particular study because there's so many different agendas out there and there are so many different uh, small studies People can go through and they can cherry pick and find 20 different studies that say what they want to say. And then they can write their own papers um, that then references all these other uh, papers. And a lot of those papers are published in these really low tier journals that have very um, loose, right, peer reviewed. Uh, you know, So they'll say that well, all of my research is based on peer reviewed research. People in fields know what good peer review is and what not good peer review is, right? They know how to identify quality literature versus very poor literature. Uh, and the general public and others can be easily fooled by individuals who claim that, um, you know, who can say like, oh, look at this paper, look at this paper, look at this paper, I have this data, I have this. And what they're doing is they can pull from sources that are not uh, high quality literature in order to make whatever point they want. But they're using the edifice of, hey, this is all peer reviewed as if, oh, well, the public believes that peer review means that if it's been peer reviewed, it must be quality stuff. No, there's some really crappy peer reviewed literature out there. Really bad. And some of it rises all the way to the level of the top journals. There's stuff that slips through. Now, the good thing about it all is that Human nature is such that when people see bad stuff published, they write about it, right? You know, it, you can't get away very long with publishing crap, even if it got through the process. Like, I'm really famous, and I really didn't pay much attention to this, and but people just, you know, didn't review it well because they trusted me, right? That bias, it gets out there, and then people are going to start writing about it, right? They're going to start tweeting about it, putting it on Facebook, talking about what's wrong with your paper and so forth. There is a corrective process, right? The community itself is a post-peer review corrective process, which 
sometimes has, makes it hard to filter it. Sometimes it's hard to filter it all the way down to actually changing the publication itself or having it retracted. But nonetheless, there is a beware of that particular paper and it will not get cited as much and other papers will get cited more. And so that's the kind of the community effect um, that over time, hopefully, hopefully improves the overall quality of papers. Um, so is it a flawed system? Absolutely. Is there a better system um, for assuring quality literature for quality data? I don't, I've never heard anyone that's come up with one, right? People have suggested stuff, but then it would be easy to find a hundred problems with anything that somebody suggested. And you end up with so many more problems that you're going to end up going back to this peer review process. Better to try to patch up and fix the glaring huge holes that do exist in peer review um, than try to completely scrap it all together. So should people be skeptical of peer review? They should have a certain amount of healthy skepticism. It's good to know something about it. That's why I'm making this video. So you can kind of get an idea of uh, there are different levels of skepticism you should have depending on the types of journals that you're, you're viewing something in. Um, and what you need to do is you need to find experts who really know literature uh, and learn how to trust some individual who know the literature well um, rather than charlatans who know how to use the peer-reviewed system to game what they want to say uh, from it. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. Um, and you could go on and on and on about peer review, and there's so many stories to tell. Uh, but I just, I just thought, you know, this one's kind of fun in terms of like just how blatant, <laughs> how blatantly bad this particular article was. Um, and like I said before, some of it's fraud, uh, some of it is just innocent mistakes that are made, and some of it is a stressed peer review system that allows these things to slip through the cracks. I mean, a paper like that should have never have been published. There's no doubt about it. Um, it should have never have uh, seen um, the light of day. Um, the number, now, despite you might hear about how there's so many more uh, retracted papers, you have to remember that there is exponentially more papers today, right? Many fold times the number of publications per year than there was 25 years ago. So if you were to say, give a total number of retracted papers from 50 years ago versus today, it would sound very dramatic in terms of the number of retracted papers, but the percentage is not that much higher. In other words, so the amount of total fraud in the system is probably fairly similar over time. Um, it's just that there's so many more papers and we also have the internet. So you hear more about the papers, you know, it's going to make new, it's going to make more news when you hear about uh, people who lie, right. And uh, abuse the system. And so you're going to think the system is horribly abused and can't be trusted at all. But what you're doing is you're basing your opinion. If that's the case on what is less than one tenth of 1% of all papers. And those one tenth of 1% of all papers, are a mixture of fraud of which is probably a small percent of that and just people who didn't really understand uh what they were doing all that well so it was innocent mistakes lack of expertise uh working outside their own field and that then getting through the peer-reviewed system because there's too many people who don't know also their field or other fields well enough to be able to adequately peer review um and so the total amount of really, really bad data uh, is not that high uh, relative to what you might think it is based on the way people talk about it, especially critics of it, all right? And honestly, the, most of the critics of peer review are ones that feel like, um, like they can't get their ideas heard. And so therefore they criticize that system. And they're also trying to justify their own self-publishing and why you should read their book rather than listen to the experts, uh, right? So that's going to be that's going to be a a universal problem for the rest of uh, all of time. Uh, that's not going to get gonna, not going to get solved in terms of fairness to everybody somehow. Uh, I feel like there was one other thing that I wanted to say that I I started to get to and then I got I distracted myself. 
don't remember what it is now. So I think maybe we'll just say let's quit there. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, subscribe, you know, click like, all that good stuff. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.